are two elephants in the room that we need to address before we start. The first is that disputes are bad for business. And the second is that networking with litigators is a bit like speaking to an undertaker at a party. No one really wants to think about litigation before they're hurtling towards it. And that's absolutely fine. We get that. As entrepreneurs, you're quite rightly focused on building your business rather than focusing excessively on possible risk. So I'm doubly pleased that you've chosen to join us today. And I want to reward you by making sure that this session is as useful to you as possible. I think the best way of achieving that is by showing you how to avoid key mistakes, which in my experience are the biggest culprits when it comes to generating disputes between businesses or making your life harder in later litigation. Frankly, the best type of dispute is one which never materialises and I'd like to put you in that position. As a litigator, I've seen the worst of commercial relationships and contract handling and I could talk all day about the things that people do which then land them in court. However, there are some issues which crop up over and over. So I'm going to spend the first part of this session running through seven issues which cross my desk repeatedly so that hopefully you'll be equipped to avoid those pitfalls in the future. I'll then talk about some of the tricks of the trade, the tactics which litigators often use to improve their client's position. This helps to improve their chances in the litigation, but also gives their clients extra leverage in settlement discussions, which we always have an eye on. And then finally, we'll spend a little time looking at how you and your lawyer can work together to make the litigation process work for you as well as possible. So without further ado, I will now reveal the first issue which chops the charts of mistakes to avoid. Termination. By some distance, the most dangerous time for a business is when it's trying to terminate a commercial contract, which it might do either because the other side is in breach or there's no particular problem, but it simply wants to bring the arrangement to an end. The process can be fraught with traps for the unwary, so there's a few key issues that I'd like to highlight for you. The first problem that we see is parties failing to comply with technical requirements for notice. So parties try to terminate by giving notice under the contract, but fails to dot all of the I's and cross all of the T's. Sometimes people assume that if they're given notice, clearly that should be sufficient. Even if it's not quite in line with what the contract says, that's really dangerous. And there's a real risk that informal notice will be treated as ineffective. So I would say really don't ignore the technicalities. And to give you an example of this, in a case I'm working on at the moment, the contract provided that it would extend automatically unless notice to terminate was given in writing before a certain date. Those requirements were not followed. Um, it said that the notice was given orally instead. And as a result, the contract now runs on for another 10 years at a cost of around 10 million pounds. The second problem which crops up around termination is when a party tries to terminate a contract for breach, but it doesn't have a proper basis for doing so. For example, the contract might allow for termination for a material breach, but then it turns out that the breach wasn't sufficiently bad to qualify as being material. So what happens when you try to terminate a contract without adequate justification? Your own attempt to terminate is treated as a breach of contract in its own right, and that puts the other side in the driving seat. They have then got a choice between either insisting that the contract continues, which leaves you stuck in the contract but with a broken relationship, or they can opt to treat the contract as completely dead and bring a claim for damages against you for your wrongful termination of the contract. They will then ask you to compensate them for the profits that they would otherwise have earned for the remainder of the life of the contract. And the final risk I'd like to highlight is where a party accidentally caps their claims for damages. So let's say that the other contracting party has let you down really badly and so you decide to terminate the contract. It might seem perfectly natural to use the mechanism for termination which is set out in the contract. So for example, you might respond to a breach by giving three months written notice of termination because the contract says that's how you should terminate. Depending on how the contract is worded, the law may treat this as a termination by agreement because you have just followed an agreed mechanism. So in the eyes of the law, you might be regarded as being happy for the contract to end early. The difficulty is this. If the other party's breach was sufficiently serious, you might have been able to say that they have repudiated the contract. And that means that they've behaved so badly that they have effectively ripped up the contract themselves without your agreement. 
In those circumstances, you might have been entitled not only to say that the contract is at an end, but also to bring a claim for all of the profits you would have made from the date of the breach until the contract was otherwise due to come to an end. Terminating by the agreed contractual mechanism may prevent a claim for those future profits, which can be quite considerable. I'm conscious that this is quite a complicated concept, so it's best illustrated by an example. And the example I'm going to give involves phones for you and EE, who are two huge commercial entities. And they no doubt had in-house legal teams and they no doubt engage very expensive lawyers. And so it just goes to show that mistakes can be made quite easily and still have grave financial consequences. So in this case, Phones for You had a contract under which it sold EE products and services. Phones for You went into administration in September 2014. And on the day it went into administration, its shops didn't open and all trading was suspended. And that led to an indefinite breach of its obligation to sell EE's products. So EE responded by serving notice of termination. That notice referred to a clause which entitled it to terminate if phones for you went into administration, which makes it seem like the obvious choice. And then EE subsequently tried to claim damages for the £200 million it expected to have earned over the remaining lifetime of the contract. The court in the end dismissed EE's claim for future losses because EE's notice had only referred to the administration clause. They should instead have referred to Phones for You's breach of contract in stopping selling EE products. And they should have claimed that Phones for You had effectively repudiated the contract. And if they'd done that, they might have been £200 million better off. This may appear harsh, but it does go to show how literally the court can treat notices of termination. It's really important to terminate on the correct basis, and that might not be the most obvious choice. And so, without the hard sell, the opinion of a good lawyer can be invaluable at this point. So, in terms of key takeaways, be absolutely sure that you have sufficient grounds to terminate a contract before you threaten to do so. If there's room for doubt, tread really carefully and consider holding discussions on a without prejudice basis where you can talk about the breach and reserve the right to terminate without actually doing so. Secondly, where the other side has committed a really serious breach of contract, get advice from a lawyer, don't automatically follow the termination procedures, it might not be your best option. And thirdly, if you're happy that giving notice under the contract is the correct course, then follow the notice requirements to the letter. Check what form is required, how and to whom it's got to be delivered, and check any timing requirements. Moving on to the second issue, which is delay. There are times when a client seeks my advice, and I have to say to them that their options are limited because they've been too slow in taking action. I'd like to ensure that you're never in that situation. So I'm now going to run through a few scenarios where it's really important for you to seek advice and take action urgently in order to protect your position. The first scenario in which urgency is critical is when you're asking a court to grant what's known as an interim injunction. Interim injunctions are useful where we want the court to act urgently to stop something which is potentially very damaging before it happens. Examples of, things, of this include preventing a defendant from stealing from you, whether that's money or intellectual property or data. It stops them from putting their assets out of reach so that you can't enforce a judgment against them. Um, or you might want to stop them from doing something which is very seriously damaging to your reputation. In the circumstances, the court may grant what's known as an interim injunction, which holds the ring before the case is fully litigated. Injunctions come in many shapes and sizes, but the injunction may order a defendant not to take a particular step. It might freeze a defendant's assets altogether, which is obviously very draconian, um, or it might prevent publication of an article. The underlying dispute is then litigated and a final decision is made many months later by the court. Because interim injunctions are granted before the court has had an opportunity to hear full arguments about all of the underlying issues, there's an increased risk that they may not be justified. And so the courts approach them extremely carefully and regard them as quite draconian. And for this reason, the courts demand that a party seeking an urgent injunction acts urgently themselves. And this in practice might mean bringing a claim within days or possibly weeks of learning about the risk that you're asking the court to block. And so if you sit on an issue of like this for a couple of weeks, it might kill the chance to get interim relief. 
And whilst that doesn't stop you from bringing a claim for damages later, there are some cases where damages aren't a complete answer to the irreparable harm which might already have been caused. Um, I'm going to give you an example of this, not least because the facts of the particular case are quite fun. So you'll have heard of the Barclay brothers, who are the, the British billionaires with interest in the media and retail and property. So this is quite recent. It's been alleged that the sons of David Barclay bugged the conservatory at the Ritz Hotel in order to record conversations between Sir Frederick Barclay and his daughter. Understandably, Frederick Barclay then made an application to block the publication of those private conversations but the court dismissed his application because it was made six weeks after the discovery of the books. So bear in mind that in this time, Frederick Barclay would have had to instruct lawyers who would have had in turn to investigate, advise on the merits of a claim and draw up the paperwork. Six weeks isn't a huge amount of time in that context, but nonetheless, it was considered to be too slow by the court. At the other end of the spectrum is the risk of waiting too long to bring a claim for damages. Most claims are subject to a limitation period, which gives you a fixed number of years in which to start proceedings. A six year limitation period crops up most commonly as it applies to most claims for breach of contract, but you might see shorter limitation periods as well. For example, three years from the date of knowledge for negligent advice, three months for judicial review, which is where you're asking the court to hold a public body to account. The mistake that people sometimes make is in not allowing enough time before that final deadline to prepare and serve the claim. It can take a considerable period to put the claim together and serve it on the defendant. And the biggest risk arises when the defendant is based abroad because you then need to budget weeks or sometimes months to track them down and deliver the documents to them in accordance with the court rules. Limitations are a really common issue and you might for example have seen it mentioned in the press because it's used quite regularly to block claims for mis-selling of financial products and tax schemes um, where the full implications of the mis-selling are not clear initially and the claimants have only recently been invited to participate in group litigation. Another delay type issue which I see very frequently in practice is where a client witnesses a serious breach of contract but then carries on as normal for a while. They might not want to rock the boat at that stage, or they may simply have their attention elsewhere. But then they later decide that they want to take action about the breach, but are told that this is now much more difficult because their delay suggests that they've acquiesced to the breach. This is particularly problematic where the breach is so serious that the victim would have been entitled to terminate the contract. At the point of the breach, the law considers that the victim has a choice between terminating the contract and continuing it which is otherwise, in, otherwise known as affirming it. If the contract is affirmed, the right to terminate falls away. A failure to raise the issue and take action quickly can easily be construed as affirmation, and then you'll be stuck in the contract with the wrongdoer. And I'm gonna give you another example here, which is Etihad Airways, who had sponsored the Force India Formula One team. So Force India took on a new investor who also happened to own Kingfisher Beer. The Kingfisher logo began to appear on the cars during off-season testing in 2007 and 2008. So after a while, in January 2008, Etihad Airways got sick of this and said that it was terminating the sponsorship agreement for breaches of its exclusive sponsorship rights. The court then held that Etihad was too late in objecting and that it had acquiesced in the changes to the branding. It had therefore lost the right to terminate the contract without notice. Even worse for Etihad was that the court decided that it didn't have a sufficient justification for its attempt to terminate the sponsorship agreement. And then the court decided that Etihad's attempt to terminate had itself been a reputatory breach of contract and it awarded Force India $4.68 million in damages. And finally, a very quick look at the impact of delay on smaller breaches where a failure can, to take action can also pose a problem. For example, if there's a, a, a breach of contract, not, not terminable, but you don't do anything about it, it can enable the other side to argue that you went along with the breach and led them to believe that you were happy to continue, so you shouldn't be entitled to complain about it later. They may say that the breach cannot be material if you didn't bother to raise it, or that by failing to flag the problem, you've not done anything to take steps to minimise the financial consequences, and that can impact the level of damages that you're able to recover.
Some contracts also build in time limits for pursuing complaints, and these can be very tight. For example, in a case I ran a couple of years ago, the contract required any complaints about complex invoices to be raised in detail within six working days of receipt, regardless of the time of year, the availability of the parties, etc. And if that didn't happen, the person who was paying the invoices was said to have permanently waived the right to complain. So acquiescence can be a really messy issue, which doesn't necessarily kill a claim, although it can do, as you saw from the Etihad Airways example. At the very least, it can give the other party a chance to run arguments, which will make it more complicated and more expensive to bring the contract to an end or seek damages. And so it's just not worth taking that risk. If there's clearly been a breach of contract, the better course is to raise the issue quickly and to send a letter or an email reserving your rights to terminate or to, to start and bring a claim for damages. So to recap the key takeaways on, on this, if there's a chance that you'll want to seek an injunction, brief a lawyer as a matter of urgency and get ready for the process to accelerate rapidly. If you think you're approaching a limitation deadline, don't leave it until the last minute to instruct a solicitor. Allow time for preparing and serving the claim. And finally, if you think that the other side has breached the contract, raise a complaint in writing and send a reservation of rights letter. Issue number three, handshake agreements and problems with, with those sorts of informal agreements. People have always reached agreements informally, whether on a handshake basis or over a phone call. Purely oral agreements are less usual these days because there's almost always a documentary trail in the form of emails, text messages and WhatsApp messages. Whilst recording the obvious terms of an agreement over email or WhatsApp helps to capture the spirit of the deal, it can also bring a false sense of security because these sorts of agreements are rarely complete and they rarely address the question of what happens if something goes wrong. We definitely see disputes about quick, abbreviated messages where the parties have reached a conflicting understanding about what's been agreed, and that, then that's ripe for litigation. There can be an even greater gulf between the parties where one side thinks that they've created a binding contract and the other thinks they've just been negotiating terms. We've also seen cases where one party is much more on top of their record keeping than the other, and when pushed to provide evidence in support of the understanding of the agreement, they can produce notes of phone calls and internal messages supporting their position. So a very recent and very topical example of this involves negotiations over the sale of millions of surgical masks. The discussions have taken place mainly on WhatsApp, with a couple of quick conversations over the phone. These negotiations were taking place at the height of the PPE crisis, when masks were being sold at a premium, so around 50 pence each. Since then, the market has caught up and the price has fallen to around six pence each. The informality of the discussions meant that it wasn't clear whether the purchasers had ever committed to buying the masks at 50 pence each, or whether they were still at the pre-contract stage, and this led to a dispute. Both sides would say that they've suffered as a result of how they've approached the contract. On the one hand, you've got a vendor who might not be able to recover the premium price that he thought he'd secured in circumstances where he could have sold the mask to someone else for that price if he'd known that the deal hadn't been completed. On the other hand, the other party is potentially bound into a very expensive contract that they didn't intend to enter into. So key takeaways on informal agreements. Always be clear whether you intend for the discussion to create a legally binding agreement rather than just part of the negotiations. Always check that informally agreed deals make sense. If in doubt, send an email at the end of the negotiating process summarising key points around dates, quantities, qualities and the circumstances in which you've got the right to cancel. And finally, if appropriate for your business, draw up standard trading terms which you can send quite easily in order to cover off the boilerplate. On to issue number four. the minority shareholder. One of my specialisms is in dealing with shareholder disputes, particularly in the context of startups. What we see quite frequently is that a few people join together to develop, fund and launch a business idea. And over time, particularly as external investment is brought in, the dynamic changes and the original founders don't see eye to eye. We also see issues in family businesses often around intergenerational handover, where there's a falling out, which then impacts a family member's position within the business. 
this topic could take up the whole webinar, and so I don't propose to go into detail, but I do think it's worthwhile being aware of how dealing with minority shareholders can sometimes lead to litigation. The first thing to be aware of is that minority shareholders have the right to petition to the court if they have been unfairly treated. And unfair treatment can cover a wide array of issues ranging from exclusion from management, unfair dealings with shares, for example, diluting the minority interest, improper dividends, paying a salary to the executive directors, and that's commercially unjustifiable, and directors or other shareholders otherwise taking advantage of the company. In lots of cases that I've dealt with, there's been no calculated plan to harm the minority shareholder, and the possibility of a complaint has come as something of a surprise, which is why I'm flagging this now as a potentially unnecessary mistake that you can hopefully avoid. To give you some examples, it might be that the minority shareholder has not been pulling their weight and there's a personal dispute with them. Or it might happen where the dominant shareholder might regard them, their business as their own and forget about sleeping partners who've historically been very quiet. And sometimes the majority will continue with historic practices after there's been a change in the shareholder body, for example, investors, new family members or a change in trusteeship. And then they're surprised when the new shareholders are more aggressive about policing their rights. All of these circumstances can crop up quite easily, but they're still breeding grounds for litigation. The second point to be aware of is how the court approaches a claim by a minority shareholder. The standard remedy for a successful minority shareholders complaint is an order requiring the majority to buy out the minority stake. The starting point is that payment for these shares will come from the other shareholders personally, and so this can be quite a significant financial imposition. So it's important to get this right. And then a few quirks of minority rights to bear in mind. Where the business is owned and managed by a small group of people, especially where they have a long-standing personal relationship, the court might brand the business as a quasi-partnership, and that means that the shareholders are expected to deal with each other with an additional level of good faith. It won't necessarily be enough to comply with the letter of company articles and shareholder agreements. And then, aside from holding you to a higher standard, if you are operating a quasi-partnership, it will also affect the price that you'll be ordered to pay to the minority shareholder for their interest. This is because the court will probably not discount that price to take account of the fact that the shares cannot be sold on the open market and they don't have a controlling stake. And finally, it's also worth bearing in mind that the court can take quite a broad brush approach to the underlying issues. There are likely to be allegations and slights on both sides, but the court tends not to want to carry out a very detailed review of the factual history. It can be particularly uninterested in any personal disputes which it regards as being tit for tat. Frankly, its approach is rather like a parent dealing with quarrelling children. Unless something really serious has happened, its inclination is to knock heads together and say, well, this relationship is just not working out, so why doesn't the majority just buy the minority out? So if you're thinking of excluding a minority shareholder from management, bear in mind that it will be quite tricky to justify this unless they've done something which is seriously damaging to the business. I'm going to give you a quick example of an unfair prejudice case I dealt with recently. It concerned a business which had been in a family for decades and was still run exclusively by family members. One of the directors had for many years failed to pull his weight. It was a constant irritation and that led to the breakdown of personal relationships. While the others were very professional and committed, he often turned up late, if at all. He undermined the management team with staff, he failed to deliver projects, he entered into some poorly judged commercial deals. If he'd been just an employee, there would definitely have been grounds to terminate his employment. However, he was not just an employee and he owned nearly 10% of the company. So when the family finally decided to suspend him, he instructed lawyers to bring a complaint for unfair prejudice. The business was valuable, largely because of the land that it owned, so he demanded that the other shareholders pay him nearly £70 million to buy out his interest. He also said that the business was a quasi-partnership, so that the discounts which would normally have been applied were irrelevant. This would have made around a 30% difference to the value of his shares. Obviously, the prospect that the court would order the majority to personally pay £70 million to buy out his shares was hugely problematic. I think this illustrates how important it is to tread carefully when taking action, which negatively affects the minority. <laughs>
So your takeaways on this are one, always keep in mind the rights of minority shareholders. This is particularly important when making changes to the management of the company and making payments to those controlling the company. Two, be alive to the need to change historic practices when bringing new shareholders on board. For example, when you have new investors or there's a change in investors due to inheritance or divorce. Thirdly, get buy into to major decisions. If a shareholder is aware of and accepts a decision, they may have acquiesced to it. Fourth, consider whether you need to improve your own internal governance. Good shareholders agreements, articles and codes of conduct create ground rules and certainty and always ensure that you've got provisions dealing with dispute resolution and deadlock. Moving on to the fifth issue on the list of mistakes to avoid. The fifth issue which regularly causes problems for clients is mishandling of documents. And I think that's partly because sometimes people are naturally enough unfamiliar with the extent of the documentation they'll be required to disclose if a dispute becomes litigious. So let's look at that. Disclosure is an absolutely huge part of any litigation or arbitration, and the parties can be ordered to disclose documents even before court proceedings are formally started. The sheer range of what you're expected to disclose can come as a surprise. Basically, you may be ordered to disclose to the other side anything on which information is recorded. Obviously, that deals with paper documents, emails and spreadsheets, but also less obvious formats such as voicemail, WhatsApp messages, metadata and social media postings. If information is recorded anywhere, be prepared to disclose it if it's relevant to the dispute. It's also worth noting that the court may expect you to reconstitute deleted documents. So against that background, the issues that we most commonly see are firstly, the unnecessary creation of dangerous documents. And I came across a great example of this a couple of years ago when in a case where our client suspected its engineering contractor was overcharging it to the tune of millions. The client was suspicious that its former managing director appeared to have turned a blind eye to the contractor's practice of submitting hugely inflated invoices. And then when it came to disclosure, one of the documents which the contractor handed over was a spreadsheet in which it had recorded payments of more than two million pounds, which it had made to the director in exchange for him turning a blind eye. This spreadsheet absolutely drove a coach and horses through the other side's case and the litigation immediately turned in our favour. Once the contractor had created it and his solicitors had seen it, there was no choice but to disclose it. And I've got no doubt that the contractor bitterly regretted creating this document in the first place. The second and more common problem we see is where a party destroys a relevant document, either accidentally or sometimes on purpose. It's quite difficult to do this without leaving some form of trail there's either a gap in a sequence or some kind of electronic trace, or sometimes a witness can, will recall that the document used to exist, and sometimes there's a forgotten copy which emerges from another source. As you would expect, the court can be quite sceptical about explanations given for missing documents if they're likely to be crucial. It can lead the court to make negative inferences about what the document might have said, and it generally undermines that party's credibility. Key takeaways. First of all, assume that anything committed to writing, however informally, will come out later. Secondly, organise your documents of potential importance, particularly documents detailing the start or the history of a company, the development of a product or a significant business transaction. Thirdly, take active steps to preserve documents if litigation is on the horizon, including by suspending any automatic deletion policies. Issue six, personal liability. The, the prospect of personal liability might strike fear into the hearts of most directors. And the good news is that by incorporating your company or LLP and by taking out DNO insurance, the risk is largely covered off. However, there are a few exceptions which it might be worth you being aware of. Many of you will already be familiar with directors' duties and the risk posed to you personally if your company isn't solvent. I'm not going to deal with those today, but instead I'm going to take a quick look at some of the less well-known issues which can put a director in the spotlight. First of all, bear in mind that a director may be personally responsible for a contract which they sign before a company has been properly incorporated. So take care not to put your name to something before the company is fully set up. Secondly, if a company is engaged in a contractual breach or other wrongdoing, such as negligence or copyright infringement, 
a director may be liable if they were aware of the issue or indeed they were the controlling mind directing the activity. It could be said that they induced the company to breach its contract or they conspired with the company to commit the wrongdoing. So it's important on a personal level, if you become aware of an issue, to intervene. I should, however, say that this type of personal claim is unusual, but that's certainly not beyond the range of possibility. Similarly, if a director or employee has directly made misrepresentations, for example, in the course of making a sales pitch, they won't necessarily be able to hide behind their company. And the final point to be aware of is that in litigation, the directors of the company may be asked to sign key court documents setting out their company's claim and version of events. If they knowingly or recklessly sign documents which contain false statements, they may be in contempt of court. Again, though, this is very unusual and requires quite a high degree of dishonesty. And so the case I mentioned earlier about the fraudulent, fraudulent engineering contractor, that's also an example of what can happen if a director makes false statements in litigation. In that case, the contractor's court documents were littered with false statements. There were all sorts of claims that various key documents had been created and signed on particular dates when in fact they'd been manufactured after the event for the purposes of the litigation. And this became evident during the disclosure process. We applied to the court to bring committal proceedings against the director personally for the signing off the statements, which is basically a first step in asking the court to consider sending that person to prison for contempt of court. As you might expect, this added pressure massively improved our position in negotiations. And I should say that that example, it did concern a very cynical fraudster, and there are a few cases which reach this stage, but the courts do expect people who put their name to formal court documents to make sure that they are accurate and to take a dim view of litigants who say that, they, who say that what they signed was just something that their solicitors put in front of them and they didn't really read it. The court expects you to know what you're signing. Finally, a very quick look at cross-border issues. Businesses are increasingly international, bringing people together from around the world, whether as partners in joint ventures or customers and suppliers. If your business is in this position, please do stop to consider what would happen if you fell out with your international partners or contractors, which laws would apply and which court would deal with the dispute. It's dangerous not to include a term or reach an agreement which addresses those points, as you might find yourself drawn into proceedings on the other side of the world in a court which approaches the legal issues very differently. And my final point on this, if you're operating internationally, do also consider whether your IP is protected in all of the territories you are operating in. So that concludes the first section of this webinar. Before we move on, um, I just wonder if anybody has any questions on the seven issues which I've just run through. So we have a question that's come through on the chat function whilst you were speaking, Kate. Uh, it says, it sometimes feels like if you bring in a lawyer too early, then it can escalate the issues and you lose control. Do you have any thoughts on how I might avoid that but without affecting my rights? I think that there's a distinction to be drawn between involving a lawyer behind the scenes and involving a lawyer in a very open way. I agree that as, as soon as you involve a lawyer and start writing legal correspondence, the tone of the negotiation changes and people can become very defensive and sometimes that can make things hard to settle. But in practice, um, what we find and what we do quite a lot is that we help clients behind the scenes so that it's not necessarily apparent that there is any kind of legal involvement at all but there is a, um, the, the client benefits from having a bit of a surer legal position. They understand their rights. They avoid making any missteps, which might make their position worse if the case does go on to litigate. Any other questions? No? So the second section of this webinar um, we'll take a look at some of the tricks of the trade and the techniques that, and the strategies that the litigators use when they're steering a dispute towards settlement. And effectively, driving negotiations forward often boils down to the application of carrots and sticks. We increase the pressure on the opponent by making our case as strong as possible and using some of the tactics I'm going to mention in order to turn the heat up even further. And then in parallel, we often open up settlement discussions, identifying the form of negotiation which is most likely to yield a result. 
And so looking first at some of the sticks. And the first stick I'm going to mention is uh, called a subject access request, also known as an SAR. Put simply, subject access requests allow an individual to request from a data controller a copy of their personal data along with details of how the data is held. Data controllers might be an employer or a business. Personal data is essentially anything which identifies you directly or indirectly. So you can appreciate this covers a broad spectrum of documents. And as a result, data controllers can be subject to quite an onerous obligation simply as a result of the individual making a standard form request. It can result in them having to review and disclose often hundreds or thousands of documents. And the courts have confirmed that the motive behind making a subject access request is irrelevant. And so it's now possible to use a subject access request as a litigation tool to dig for information and to put pressure on the other side. You might use this when you think that you've got a claim against someone, but you feel that you're missing some hard proof of the wrongdoing against you. And it can also be useful leverage in achieving a settlement if the opposition do not want to go through the trouble and expense of responding to the request. So I've set out some pros and cons here. And the advantages are that firstly, these offer a pretty rare opportunity in litigation to launch a fishing expedition without having to put forward a good justification. It can be done before the litigation is commenced, and if a smoking gun is found, this can facilitate early settlement discussions and avoid the time and expense of progressing the litigation through to the disclosure phase. Secondly, it's extremely inexpensive and low risk, unlike disclosure, which usually costs thousands and can expose you to the risk of having to pick up the other side's cost. All you have to do is send a standard form letter. The data controller can't ignore a subject access request, as this could open them up to um, a complaint under data protection legislation. However, they may not have to comply with your request if the information you're requesting falls within certain specific exemptions, so bear that in mind. And then finally, there's a deadline. All requests must be answered at the latest within a month of receipt, although it can be extended by a further two months in certain circumstances. But in terms of the downside, I think it's fair to say that subject access requests are not necessarily a magic bullet. First of all, there's no guarantee that you'll find what you're looking for. The purpose of the subject access request is to inform the individual about the state of their personal data and the response which is given. It could be in a prescribed format and that may not necessarily be useful to you. Secondly, whilst you can tailor your request to a degree, there's still a prospect that you'll receive hundreds of documents that are irrelevant to the dispute. Thirdly, and this happens really frequently, it's possible that the documents provided will be heavily redacted. However, even if that's the case, the provision of a redacted document is proof that it, is, that it exists. And this can be a useful basis to press for more complete disclosure and litigation later. Moving on to my second stick, personal liability. As I mentioned earlier, it's an excellent way to make more senior employees feel uncomfortable and therefore more likely to settle. Um, if we raise the idea that they're personally entangled in the litigation. And so we tend to consider whether there's a basis to bring them into a dispute at an early stage, for example, by saying that they've been the controlling mind behind the breach, or they might have made an actionable representation themselves. The first stick I'm going to mention is secure security for costs, which is a, a, a litigation technicality, so, so bear with me. Security for costs is a principle which recognises that as a defendant, you may be forced to incur considerable legal costs in defending yourself, even if the case is without merit. There's then a risk that having incurred those costs, it will be difficult to recover them from the claimant because they're not good for the money or they're based in another jurisdiction. An order for security for costs gives you some protection against this. It requires the claimant to put security up front so that if a costs order is later granted in your favour, it's easily enforced. However, this is only available in certain circumstances. First of all, it's necessary for court proceedings already to be up and running and not just threatened. And more than that, you need to show that the claimant meets certain criteria, including either the claimant, whether it's an individual, a company or a corporation, must be resident out of the jurisdiction, or the claimant would be a company in financial difficulties, or maybe the claimant's slippery and they've changed their address since the claim was started in order to avoid the consequences of litigation. Or maybe they gave a false address 
The security audit can be a significant sum and this can act as a strong deterrent to claim claimants who are looking to pursue a claim against you. It requires them not only to have the capital to fund their own costs up front, but they also need to set aside money for your costs in the event that they lose. For the right type of claim, this can be a very effective litigation tool to dissuade spurious claims and it also focuses the party's minds on resolution at an earlier stage. Another tactic as a defendant is to shift the balance of power by bringing a counterclaim against the claimant. Of course, being able to do this depends on whether you have got the grounds to do so, but it would be one of the first things to consider when a claim is brought against you. We'd normally introduce the threat of a counterclaim into the pre-action phase before a claim is issued. It can be very effective to make the claimants evaluate the strength of their claim and weigh up the risks of taking it further. So, with four sticks out of the way, I'd like to explore the other, more positive approaches to settlement discussions. First of all, I'm going to talk about Part 36 offers. Because they're a type of settlement offer, I've included them with the other carrots, but as you will see, they've got a bit of a sting in the tail. Basically, Part 36 offers are a special form of settlement offer, which can have serious cost consequences if the other side chooses not to accept. They're an ex they are excellent tools to focus your opponent's mind on settlement, and if settlement isn't achieved, it can give you some cost protection. And as a result, Part 36 offers should be considered at an early stage of the dispute and then at all subsequent key stages. Both claimants and defendants can make Part 36 offers, and they have to follow a particular format, which is set out in the court rules. So the offer must be in writing, it must be open for a period of no less than 21 days, and so on. The Part 36 offers must also be a genuine offer to settle and therefore must include some kind of concession. So you couldn't, for example, just put in a Part 36 offer for the whole value of your claim. I think it's easiest to explain how they work by taking you through an example. The first example involves a claimant making a Part 36 offer. So this hypothetical claimant has a claim for £1 million and so they send a letter in the correct format offering to accept £750,000. The defendant chooses not to accept, and then the claimant wins at trial and is awarded the full £1 million that they claimed in the first place. The claimant has beaten their Part 36 offer. They've done better than the £750,000 that they offered to accept. So they're entitled to certain additional benefits as a result of the Part 36 regime. In particular, the defendant will be ordered to pay a higher proportion of the claimant's legal costs than is normally the case. In addition, they'll be ordered to pay interest at up to 10% above base rate, and there may be an additional award of damages of up to £75,000. And Part 36 offers have benefits for depend, defend, defendants too, although on a slightly different basis. So let's look at a hypothetical example again, where a defendant has made an offer to pay £750,000 against a claim for a million. Here the defendant would also benefit from the mechanism if the claimant fails to beat that offer at trial. In a scenario where the claimant was ultimately awarded £600,000, that claimant would have won the litigation and would usually expect to recover most of their costs. However, because they have failed to do better than the defendant's offer of £750,000, they're penalised and they will be ordered to pay the legal costs which the defendant incurred once a 21-day window for acceptance of the offer had closed. Now, litigation could be hugely expensive and so the prospect of paying for two sets of legal fees, even when you've won, can be a very influential factor. So the finally judged Part 36 offer can genuinely increase the pressure on the opposition as there are tangible financial consequences if they make a decision to reject the offer but then are later proved to be wrong. Looking now at another form of dispute resolution which is mediation. If you're not familiar with it, mediation is a form of facilitated negotiation in which a neutral and suitably qualified third party works to bridge the gap between the parties and pushes them towards settlement. Traditionally, in the pre-COVID days, it took the form of a day-long negotiation during which the mediator shuffled back and forth between the parties, presenting offers, suggesting different commercial approaches and generally steering both sides towards a resolution. Often heads of terms are agreed on the day and then they're later converted into a full settlement agreement. In my experience, mediation is extremely effective. It forces the parties to engage and invest in the negotiating process, 
and skilled media mediators are very adept at offering a different view, exploring possible solutions and persuading even the most entrenched parties to be commercial and reach a deal. I would say that 80 or 90% of the mediations I've participated in have resulted in a settlement. They can be particularly effective where tensions are running high and there's a history between the parties and the skilled mediator then acts as a buffer between them. And bear in mind that even if the mediation is unsuccessful, it can give you an insight into what's really important to the other side and gives you something to think about in terms of future negotiations. It also gives you and your lawyers a chance to assess the other side and how they might perform as witnesses. In addition to the more formal negotiating options I've just outlined, many cases are settled with much less legal involvement. If the relationship can bear it, it can be useful for the clients to speak directly, to knock the dispute on the head in a very commercial way, or to involve other shared contacts who are able to broker a deal in a less legalistic way. In some cases, it's helpful to play a form of good cop, bad cop, using your solicitors as the bad cop, which I know may be hard to believe. The solicitors can send robust letters which firmly assert your formal position and give you protection, whilst as part of an agreed strategy you can open up a parallel channel of communication with your commercial counterparts to try to reach a sensible solution. I find that this can be particularly helpful where both sides have a potential claim and they've sensibly instructed lawyers to protect their positions in formal correspondence, but really are quite keen to settle. The combination of formal letters and a confidential without prejudice discussion can potentially avoid protracted and costly litigation on both sides. And finally, a similar pragmatic approach which we always consider is whether the parties can enter into a new commercial relationship. Obviously there are many cases in which the personal relationship has so severely broken down that it's unthinkable that you would enter into a new deal. However, in other cases, two commercial parties are able to think of other ways in which they might work together. And this lateral approach can help to bridge the gap rather than focusing exclusively on who is right and who is wrong in the litigation. The case I mentioned earlier about the surgical masks was ultimately settled by the parties agreeing new terms for the purchase of the masks. The deal was mutually beneficial and it leaves the door open for further collaboration. If we'd focus purely on the legal issues rather than taking a commercial approach, we might still be litigating. So it's always worthwhile thinking through every angle as a good settlement is always better than protracted litigation. And finally, I'd like to touch upon a few points which might help you and your lawyers work together well if a dispute does become more litigious. And the first recommendation I would make which I promise you again, it's not a hard sell, is that it's really important to instruct the lawyer at the right time. Please come and talk to us if you're thinking about terminating a contract and it's potentially controversial or if you've got a dispute brewing. We're happy to give you some idea of the red flags and a quick steer. And by talking to litigators, it doesn't mean that you'll be drawn into litigation. We often just give our clients a bit of help behind the scenes, which goes to the question that I answered earlier. Secondly, I would also like to urge you to flag up any problem issues early. The vast majority of clients do this, but some are embarrassed and um, sometimes they just haven't given the issues enough in-depth thought before they approach us. But it's always better to flush out issues early so that we can give you accurate merits advice and formulate a plan which deals with any problems in the most optimal way. My third recommendation is that if you're a claimant, have a conversation with your lawyer about whether a third party funder might be interested in paying for the cost of the litigation in return for a fee which could be paid out of the proceeds. This is only available in certain cases, usually funders are looking for large claims with good prospects of success against a solvent defendant, and the fee can be expensive. But this may be necessary to get your claim off the ground, so it's always worth exploring. And my fourth point, I've said think ahead. And what I mean by this is that litigation can be long and expensive, it, if you don't settle it, it usually takes upwards of 18 months and often longer to get to court. And it can be really onerous in terms of the amount of input required from you. For example, when we're dealing with disclosure and witness statements and generally we'll need your instructions on tactical issues throughout. So be clear with your lawyers about whether it's more important for you to settle the case and get the litigation out of the way or whether what you're fighting about is important enough for you to take it all the way to trial. Also, be clear about your tolerance for risk. Some clients find litigating enormously stressful and others don't. 
I mention this because it's quite common for clients to be understandably very anger, angry and eager to take action when a dispute first erupts. But six months down the line, they realise that they're in it for the long haul and they find it difficult. So taking account of all of these practical factors at an early stage can improve your litigation decision making. And my final point is related to this. Keep a cool head. Ultimately, commercial litigation is a financial transaction which brings with it a significant degree of risk. Even if you have an extremely good case on the merits, litigators always tend to budget a 20 to 25 percent chance of loss to take account of factors which aren't immediately apparent on the papers, such as the attitude of the judge or the performance of witnesses. So take a step back and try to assess the litigation as you would any other business opportunity. Weigh up the advantages and disadvantages with a cool head and you are more likely then to make good decisions. So that's pretty much it. Well done for staying with me. Um, the next couple of slides summarise the top 10 takeaways, but they're things I've already run through, so I don't propose, propose to take you through them all now. But we can send these notes to you um, by email afterwards so that you've got them for future reference. So I think we've got a few minutes left now for any questions. Vicky, do we have anything through the chat function? There we go. Yes, we do. And um, we've got a couple of uh, comments and some questions that have come through. Um, so the first question is, when would you recommend resolving a dispute by arbitration rather than going to court? And what are the pros and cons of that process? So arbitration is um, a process which is specifically agreed between the, the two parties that they're going to resolve the dispute in that particular way and, and normally that agreement is set out in the contract that's being litigated so it might already be decided for you if you have a contract which has an arbitration clause in it then the likelihood is that you're bound by that and that you will then um, be forced to resolve the dispute in that way but some parties do agree after a dispute has arisen to enter into a, a new arbitration agreement because they prefer arbitration to litigation. And the, the, the differences are subtle, but they're important. A lot of the process is the same. So you, you tend to go through the same process of, of setting out your statements of case, dealing with disclosure, witness statements, and then there's a trial at the end. So in many respects, it's very similar to litigation. However, it's a more it's a more private and a more bespoke process. So um, it is completely confidential. And that is often the, the, the driving uh, factor in the decision to arbitrate rather than litigate. This is not something that would ever hit the press and everybody who participates in the process needs to keep it quiet. And then secondly, it's a bespoke process that there is an agreement between you, your opponent and the arbitrator. And uh, what that means is that you drop quite a lot of the the formality and the um, bureaucracy that sometimes surrounds the court procedure. So you will be dealing with your arbitrator by email. Sometimes you can convene a hearing relatively quickly, whereas um, if, if there's a, a need to see a judge, sometimes it takes weeks to organise that. So it can be a, a more nimble procedure overall. Um, but, but ultimately, they are two quite similar processes. In terms of the, the downsides of arbitration, it can be more expensive sometimes because in addition to paying for your legal team, the other side paying for their legal team, you're also paying for the arbitrator and the arbitral institution as well, and, and that can increase the costs. Okay, and the uh, second question um, relates to what you were saying on subject access requests. So it's flipping it on the other to say what's the appropriate way to deal with a subject access request if you're on the receiving end of one. So things like how quickly should you respond, um, should you involve lawyers and at what stage? Well I, I see that we have Ian De Freitas listening in who is our, our resident data expert so I don't know Ian whether you want to unmute yourself and, and uh, comment on this question. Um, so subject access request when you get one, you, can't, you can hear me can you? Yes, we can. Thanks, yeah. Ian. Um, so um, if you receive one, uh, don't hang around. You don't have long to uh, respond to it. Um, if you're quite uh, clever about it, you can, you can deal with it in a way which means that you don't reveal very much at all. Kate mentioned earlier that um, you can redact a lot of material. And, uh, for example, one of the ways of redacting material is because it refers to other people. And so what you end up with in terms of what you have to disclose is not very much at all because often you know, material 
will be a conversation or, or will refer to other people and, and, and it's their private information. So um, in those sorts of circumstances, what you actually hand over may not be of much use at all. It is, however, a real problem, though, in some cases where, for example, somebody's rooting around for uh, things like defamatory statements or uh, you've been misusing their private information or, or, or similar things. Uh, and then it's very difficult not to disclose what they're looking for. So does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, so we've got another question um, about, uh, you mentioned about litigation funding, and that was whether backing from funders, does that act as a stick or a carrot, in your opinion? I, th I think that it can act as, a, in, in terms of the, the settlement negotiations, I think it can signal that somebody is, is well funded when they might not otherwise have been, and I think it signals as well that they've, they've passed a certain threshold um, of, of merits assessment and therefore they have a good case and so there is a there is a possibility that somebody who is funded might fight the case longer and harder than they might otherwise but, but equally funders are commercial beasts ultimately and they they don't have the same emotive attachment to the litigation so it might change the tenor of the discussions and shift it from being one which is emotionally driven to one which is effectively a financial calculation. Thank you. Um, and then just on the chat function, um, we've just had a, a few comments about um, the information being really helpful, um, but also that as a startup business, the costs of getting a legal view at an early stage or um, just getting like an overview from solicitors can be quite frightening and a bit daunting, um, which I'm sure is something that we sympathise with as lawyers. Um, and I think ties into what you were saying in terms of it doesn't have to be sort of a big task. Um, mm. and that it's just having that initial discussion. Um, but I don't know if you've got any comments on, on, on that. No, I, I mean, I would say that, that, that we, we quite regularly have very early dipping the toe in the water type discussions with people who are, are considering whether or not to litigate, whether or not they have a, 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 a valuable claim to pursue or not. Um, and, and we can do that relatively inexpensively. And, and we probably pride ourselves on, on not being the type of law firm that will take advantage of somebody in that situation and start the clock running and, and be very aggressive about what we charge for that. So mm -hmm. I think it's always worth coming to us and, and having a chat about it and we'll see if we can help you. Um, and you know, we'll be honest with you about what the cost will be going forward as well. So if you do decide to take things forward, then we can help you and you'll know exactly where you are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. So there are no further questions that I can see that have come through on the chat function. But if anyone has any questions and would like to come off mute, then we'd like to hear from you. Nope. No, I think that's all. Great. Well, thank you everyone again for coming. And do please join us for the closing reception of Entrepreneurs Week 2020, which promises networking opportunities and prizes for the best cocktails. Um, I think it starts at about half an hour at 5 p.m. and you can register on our microsite using the link which is shown on the screen just there. And so if I don't see you there, enjoy the rest of the evening and have a great weekend. Thank you.